Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe so we can get you these messages every single week. Have a great day. Today is the day that we come in church to celebrate as Palm Sunday, which, as you know, if you follow the events of the calendar, is the beginning of what we know as Holy Week. And if you follow us on any platform that we have over the next week, we're going to be commemorating each day as each day comes along. I, I have a habit every year that I, that I like to stay with that I commemorate the days and, and what days happened, which day, what happened on those days. Monday, you know, Jesus clears the temple. It's, it's one, of my, one of my favorite days. Uh, Tuesday, he goes to the Mount of Olives and he gives the Olivet Discourse. I, I love that moment of sitting there with Jesus on the Mount of Olives as he shares Matthew 24, Matthew 25, the end of the world, the end of the age, those kinds of things. On Wednesday, as we understand the calendar, Wednesday was silent. Uh, Many believe that is the day that Judas Iscariot betrayed him. Thursday is, of course, the Passover meal that he celebrated with the disciples together. Friday was, of course, the crucifixion. And then on Sunday, next Sunday is Resurrection Day. But for today, I want to offer something, if I may, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your Bible... And if you wouldn't mind, please stand with me, please, as we read together God's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 17, where the Apostle Paul writes these words. He said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. There was a discussion that was continuing before this about how all that was supposed to be followed, but... The Apostle Paul just goes straight to the heart of it. He says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I've always loved that phrase. I've always loved that that phrase, and every preacher can testify to that reality that there are times, and maybe you've had them in the pew, that there are times in this process where we sit down and we think, this is the strangest thing ever. (laughs) Talking head at the front of the room reads from a book that we all have in our lap and says words that we've all heard before. The foolishness of preaching. I've always loved that. Does it make any sense? This year, I want to mark the occasion of Palm Sunday by preaching to you on the cross. That is it. That is all the cross of which the Apostle Paul said in verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that are perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. And then he continued on in verse 21 by saying it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I recognize today and I hope that you will that I'm here this morning on an assignment. I don't know how many more of those assignments I have, but I'm I'm here today on this one. I'm not here to razzle. I'm not here to dazzle. I'm not here to impress you. I'm not going to try. I'm not trying to find some new thing that nobody else has ever seen from the Bible at all. I'm trying to just bring a word from heaven to earth. I'm praying that God will use this word, whatever this happens to be, to turn something in your life today. Let's, Let's just believe him for it. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the preaching of the cross. We pray this morning that that word will change lives, and we thank you for it. And they said together, Amen. Amen. May be seated, please. As I've told you many, many times before, and I hope it inspires you to do something similar in your life, for the last 42 years that I've been in ministry, this is just my personal habit, this is what I do, and I, I encourage you to do something either exactly like that or identical to it. For the last 42 years, I have actively sought out and listened to at least one sermon every single day of my life. Every day. Every day of my life, at least one. I find someone, I find something to listen to because I know that 
My soul needs fresh. My soul needs filling. My soul needs refreshing. And so I, I go after that every day of my life. And one of the reasons why believers are so stale is that sometimes they get fed on Sunday and then they don't touch it again until next Sunday. No wonder you're starving to death. You can't stay fresh like that. So let me encourage you one more time every day of your life. Find a word, find a preacher, find a sermon and listen to that thing every single day. I promise you it will change you since a few months ago, I found an, an older sermon uh, by a man named Alistair Begg. Oh. Alistair Begg. He's not unfamiliar to me, not unfamiliar, obviously, to you, but he's not someone that I, I listen to on a, on a regular basis, so I, I needed to find out a little more about him. Since 1983, he has been the pastor of Parkside Church in Cleveland, Ohio, serving there since he started. He is the host of that daily radio program, Truth For Life, that probably all of you know. If you hear his voice, you know who Alistair Begg is. He's Scottish. He's been in ministry since he graduated from the London Theological Seminary in 1975. And everything that I could find about him tells me that he is one of the most respected, balanced, and biblical voices of reason that is out there today. One of the reasons I love him is he's not flashy. He's not splashy. He's not trying to entertain or impress you. He's just trying to bring a word from heaven to earth. On this particular day, he was preaching about salvation, the salvation of a lost soul. He was using as his text that day, Acts chapter 16, very familiar text, the, the, the jailbreak when Paul and Silas were in prison. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And as they sang and sang their praises, there was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. And all of the doors of the prison swung wide open. And when the jailer, the Philippian jailer, came in and saw what was going on, he drew his sword. He was going to kill himself because he knew if he didn't, his superiors would. And just as he was about to kill himself, the Apostle Paul said, Do yourself no harm. We are all here. No one has run. No one has left. We are all still here. And without any prompting, spontaneously... The jailer asked this question, what must I do to be saved? Amen. There was no prompting. There was no sermon. There was no altar call. There was no Hammond B3 organ. He just asked the question, which is the question of all questions. Paul answered in verse 31. You know your Bible. You know very simple words. In verse 31 of Acts chapter 16, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Answering the most important question that any of us will ever, listen to me, ever deal with in the most simple and biblical way. In this day where there is so much pantheism and a plethora of religions all swirled in, in syncretism, all swirled into a massive bunch, we need some clear revelation. How can someone know that they are born again? How can someone know that they are forgiven of their sins, saved from wrath, right with God, and justified by faith? How is that even possible? And as a part of that message that day, he asked a question that I have literally heard <laughs> hundreds of times in my life, and maybe you have too. In church, in school, at altar calls, in revival meetings, in tent meetings, in camp meetings, since I was a little boy to now, the question is this. Finish it for me. If you were to die today, you already know where this is going. In his sermon, he asked the question, if you were to die today and Jesus were to meet you at the gate of heaven and ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? If you've been in church or in any evangelistical meeting of any kind. I'm sure JT has asked this a thousand times. Yeah. If you've been cornered at a family function by the family evangelist, anybody know who I'm talking about? You've got that one preacher in the family that at every Thanksgiving meal is going to make sure that everybody's saved. If you've bumped into a street preacher, you're walking down St. George Street and you just bump into some guy with a megaphone yelling, if you've sat down on a plane next to a soul winner, You've probably heard that before. If you were to die today and Jesus were to meet you at the gate and ask you how, why should I let you in? What would you say on this day in that sermon? He said something that I had never heard anyone say. 
It excited my soul, and I couldn't wait to get here on Sunday to tell you all about it. You're not as excited about it as I am, but I'm pretty excited about it. He said, any answer that begins with the word I is probably going to be wrong. I went, oh, you just eliminated about 95% of our responses, Alistair. Any answer that begins with the word I is probably going to be wrong. I'm saved because I did this. I did that. I go to church. I live right. I read my Bible. I'm a good person. I've been baptized. I serve. I give. Y'all see where this is going. I pray, even though that sounds okay. He made the point that it's probably not. Because any answer that starts with you mm, immediately shifts the focus away from Jesus and on to you. It blessed my soul. The older saints in the building will, will appreciate this, that he summed up that theological statement with an old, old song, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages was written in 1762 when J.D. was six years old. 1762. <laughs> He, he said that the proper answer, here it is, for all time and eternity on the internet, put this on the web, for all time and eternity, that the answer should be verse 3. He said, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Amen. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. He said that we must never forget that this is all about Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Amen. This is all about Jesus and his finished work on the cross. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit went to work on my soul about the cross. Reminding me. Reminding me as a preacher that in these days of fuzzy theology and life coach preaching. The cross which was once central to our theology, has been forgotten and sometimes seems to be fighting to be included in all of our festivities. As if we are having all of these great things going on. And oh, oh yeah, by the way, let's not forget about that. And if you don't understand what that means, let me help you with it. Seminary 101. That when you seek to understand what the Bible is all about, one of the ways that you can see it is this way. That everything that happened before the cross was pointing to it. And everything that happened after the cross will always look back to it. Let the church say amen. That everything that happened before the cross of Jesus was always intentionally looking forward from the moment that Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. They were looking forward to the cross. From the moment that Jesus died and was buried and was resurrected, everything from that moment up until and including this moment and beyond is always going to be looking back to the cross, meaning that none of this is about us. It is not about us. It's not about religion. It's not about buildings. It's not about services. It's not about set lists. It's not about programs and personalities or performance. It is all about the cross of Jesus. It seems to me to be the greatest revelation of all. That man was created by God. God created man. Man fell. Man became a sinner. Because of sin, we need a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ who left heaven to come to earth to suffer, bleed, and die on a cross to carry the sin of the world on himself. And everything about that, everything about that shows us the hand of God. That the hand of God was all over this. On this day, Palm Sunday, the triumphant day of entry into Jerusalem, when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey's back, they threw their palm branches in the street and cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes. There were people in that crowd that day, you've read the story, who said, what does this mean? What does this mean? Who is this? And that question was answered in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. 
He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And everything about this testifies that the hand of God was all over this. He was crucified on a tree because it all started on a tree in the garden when Adam and Eve fell by eating the forbidden fruit. His hands were pierced because with their hands they plucked the fruit from the tree in disobedience to the command of God to not leave it, leave it alone. His feet were pierced because our feet are swift to run to mischief. His side was pierced because Eve was taken from the side of Adam and needed redemption. He wore a crown of, y'all ain't saying nothing. He wore a crown of thorns because the curse in Genesis 3 included thorns and thistles as a part of the curse. And on that day, Jesus was redeeming us from the curse of it all. And it all happened, y'all, on the cross. Let the church say amen. It all happened on Calvary's cross. There was a time, and I'm going to preach before I get out of here. There was a time when the cross dominated our worship. There wasn't a song service that you had that didn't say something about the cross. If you came to church, you were going to sing about the cross of Jesus. You didn't make it through a song service without singing about the cross. Some of you old folks, y'all remember some of the most heart-stirring songs we ever sang were songs about the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. The burden of my soul was rolled away. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Where y'all at? Jesus, keep me. Jesus, keep me near the cross. They're a precious fountain, free to all from heaven's stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. There was a time when the cross dominated our worship. There was a time when preaching the cross of Jesus dominated our preaching. Preachers preached the cross. We preach the cross understanding that the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness. That lost people would come and sit and listen and think, how can you possibly call him a savior when he dies naked between two thieves? The preaching of the cross was where our salvation was found. Now we live in a day when it seems that every preacher is trying to find some new thing that no one else has ever seen. I hope somebody else in here is as sick of it as I am. Trying to find some new thing that nobody else has ever seen. I'm all about revelation. But sometimes I think these new preachers find something and even God goes, oh, I didn't know that either. Wow, that's pretty good. Write that down. Next time we write another book, we'll put that in it. I'm tired of it, man. They keep trying to find something that no one else has ever seen instead of turning attention to the one thing that we have all seen. We have all seen the cross of Jesus. We've all seen it. We've all seen it. That on that cross, he suffered, bled, and died. Paul said, Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not with words of man's wisdom. Because if I use the words of man's wisdom, the cross would be made to be useless. Read the sermons, y'all. Immediately after the crucifixion, and you will see that the apostles, thank God for them, did not shy away from it at all. They embraced the cross. You would think that they might have said, well, you know, they killed him on that. And if I say too much, they might kill me on another one. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus, or Peter said, we preach Jesus who you crucified. Yeah. Ooh, come on, son. In Acts chapter 4, Peter said the same thing to the same crowd. We preach Jesus who you clowns, I added that word, crucified. (laughs) Y'all crucified him. Acts chapter 5. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus who you slew and hung on a tree. But now, am I wrong? Somehow tragically it feels like the cross has been relegated to the fringes. It has tragically become a nice part of it all. Almost an interruption. It it, it may just be the random ravings of an older preacher returning, longing for a return to a different day. But it often seems to me that almost everyone and everything has become more important than that. Y'all buckle up. 
You should have come in here buckled up. Put your chin strap on. Put your tooth guard in. Yes, come. <laughs> Too many conversations today. I'm sick of them. Too many conversations today sound like this. How big is your church? You know what your answer should be? Not big enough. Whether you're meeting in a storefront or a 10,000 seat auditorium, your answer should always be, it is not big enough. Because there's still lost people all around us. How famous is your pastor? How many books has he written? How many TV shows is he on? How cool, how long, and how loud is your music? Mm. I'm not down in any of that. Before Jared gets mad at me and calls, calls me out for calling that out, I'm not downing that. I'm reminding you that none of that is the point. None of that is the point. Oh, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. You start talking about music, he's like, hold on, Dad, hold on now. Your pastor doesn't need to be famous. Nobody needs to know my name. Every sermon that you preach does not have to be a master class on preaching. And it's become that because there's so many, so many critics sitting in pews all across the country that are ready to fire the preacher an email if he didn't preach as good as this one or that one or didn't come up with a revelation. You're falling behind everybody. Every sermon does not have to be a master class on preaching. It just needs to preach the gospel. If you just stand up and say Jesus loves you and that's what the congregation needed to hear that day, then you need to close your Bible and say amen and go get a hamburger because you fulfilled the Great Commission. Your music department does not need to be worshipped. Where y'all at? Y'all are supposed to do something right there. Does not need to be worshipped. The truest measure of our effectiveness always should be. Did we preach? Come on. A sinless, spotless Savior Amen. crucified. Amen. Did anyone, did anyone that day meet Jesus? Did anyone? Was there anyone in our house born again today? Did anyone come face to face with their sin at the cross and realize he is their savior? Did we lift him up so well that everyone was drawn to him and not to our cool church? But they were drawn to the suffering savior to forgive their sins at my age. I am seeing this as clearly as I've ever seen it in my life that so much of religion doesn't matter. And it will eventually become heresy if we don't remember that at the very heart of it all is a cross. The cross. His cross. Y'all give me a minute. On the day of his baptism, Jesus was not introduced by John as author, speaker, life coach, the best motivator I've ever heard, celebrity pastor, host of Jesus today. John introduced him as the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Meaning that it was and it still is all about the cross. Somebody please amen that. That's your best amen point right there. That it is still all about the cross. Yet sometimes in our goofy churches we sometimes feel like everything else is supposed to take center stage. And even though it does get brought up at Easter. One day out of 365 it still gets lost in our Easter stuff. I'm over Easter y'all. Concerts, clothes, 
What's your outfit? What you gonna wear? How you gonna look? I don't care if you come in here in bib overalls. I'm glad you're here. I don't care if you got drunk before church. I'm glad you're here. He's still catching hell for that. No, we do not endorse cocaine in this church. Right that way. Rabbits. Egg hunts. This is the one that's going to make y'all mad. Egg hunts. I'm over it. Yes. Tired of it. I'm tired of seeing it. I get it. Have them at your house. Have them with your kids. Run around. Find eggs. I like that. I like that. But at church? Come on now. Oh, I found that nerve. Everybody's like... Y'all push back. You've been wrong before. It's all right. I've been, and I've been doing it like this a long time. Y'all, some of y'all that were with us on Kings Estate Road, there's still three of you here. I, I ran the rest of them off. When we were on Kings Estate Road, I swear to Buddha, one Sunday morning, I walked up to my, my window at my office that looked out at the parking lot. It's Easter Sunday morning. I look out of my window, and I, I swear to you, out by the front drive of our church, on the back of a trailer pulled by a truck was a 15-foot fiberglass Easter bunny. Just standing there like... Larry, you might remember. I, 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 he was one of the ushers at the time. I said, you get that thing out of this parking lot now. The guy thought it would be funny to put a bunny... In, and no, it's not funny. It's not about the bunny. It's about the Jesus. Get the bunny out of the They ran the bunny, took the bunny to somewhere. I don't know where they went. I'd have probably paid money to light it on fire, just watch it burn. <laughs> Hang with me here. I'm almost done. I got another hour. <laughs> when the passion of the Christ was released, Amen. Kathy and I were invited to a, a sneak preview. Wish I hadn't gone. Just tore me up. People were shocked at the brutality of it all. Because no movie had ever done that. Had ever accurately depicted the slaughter of the Savior. Yes, it's ugly. But so is sin. We think sin is not ugly. Sin is ugly. Yes, it's horrifying. But not as horrifying as eternal separation from God because nobody had the guts to tell you about that. Can't we, preacher, somebody's going to send me a letter this week. Can't we just talk about love? Absolutely. But you can't talk about love without talking about the cross. You cannot talk about love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to die on that cross. Greater love has no man than this that he would lay down his life for his friends. There's no way to dress it up and make it look nice. So we shouldn't try. We shouldn't try to make it look nice. The cross is not jewelry. The cross is not wall decoration. The cross of Jesus is not seeker friendly. It's not. The burden of my heart today is that we must declare this. We must declare this. That standing between me and eternity is a cross. His cross. The only remedy for my sin is found in the cross of Jesus. For me, somewhere between the cradle and the grave... I must go there. I'm going to say that again. Somewhere between the cradle and the grave, I must go there to the cross and have a reckoning that all of that was for me. That was for me. I must go to the cross. And then when I go to the cross, I can never leave it behind. Because Jesus said, if any man will come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You thought I'd forgotten the text. I have not in Corinthians. That's what all of that is what Paul is focusing on. They were doing, and read the book of 1 Corinthians, they were doing what religion does. All the wrong things. 
when I read it, I, 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 I have the, the, the benefit of two or 3,000 years or 2,000 years beyond it so I can read it and shake my head. They were, they were arguing about spiritual gifts. Do you have this? Well, do you have that? Well, are you this way? Are you that way? They were, there was sectarianism that was going on between them. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I was baptized by Apollos. Sectarianism. Our group is better than your group. Is this too real? In the church, we still do it today. Yeah, our church is better. Than, don't ever tell somebody our church is better than their church. Yeah. It's not. It is not. It is not. Y'all have got a messed up preacher. Our church is not better. We're the best church in this town. You ain't even the best church in, on this road. <laughs> I'm working out some stuff in here this morning. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my therapy session. He, he, he brings them to the very place that I am right now, the ground of the cross. Your salvation will not be as grounded as it should until you understand the price that was paid to purchase it. Isn't that good? Your salvation will not be as grounded as it should until you understand the price that was paid to purchase it. I cringe when I hear somebody say, usually a worship leader, I cringe when I hear somebody say, oh, Jesus is so cool. He suffered, he bled, and he died. Alone, naked on a cross, between two thieves, unrecognizable as a human. His visage was more marred than any other man. That's where he died. He died there on that cross for us. Not so that we could have a good time in church. Go ahead. Singers, y'all come on up. I'm, I'm, I'm wore out. Not so that we could have a good time in church. Not so that we could have a mega church. How big is your church? Not big enough. Lost souls need to be won to Jesus. I understand this kind of preaching is not for everyone. But for whoever it is, we're going to find them. He died on the cross not so that you could call him cool and not so that you could have a man bun. <laughs> Get a real cool Jesus tattoo on your arm. Okay. I have tattoos in case anybody wants to judge me for that. I cringe when I hear that. It's not didn't do that so we could just have cool services. Silly billboards around town. This is what Palm Sunday is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Give me the key of C. At the cross, at the cross, where I first Let's go back to the cross. Let's go back to the cross. Oh, I've been saved 30 years, preacher. Go back to the cross. You probably need it more than the guy that was saved last week. Get your hard-hearted tail back to the cross. Go back to the cross. Kneel at his feet. Confess your sins. Humble yourself before him. Trust him. makes sense to anybody that's in this room this morning 
but let's go back to the cross. Because it was at the cross that Jesus died. It was at the cross that Jesus paid it all. It was at the cross that He shed His blood to wash away all of our sins. And we all need a Savior. And that Savior hung on that cross. Heads bowed. Open your heart with me. Palm Sunday, 2024, I trust that you will never, never forget the message of the cross. Father, today, your kingdom come, your will be done, your word be heard, that lives be changed. In some cases, God, let a prodigal hear that they needed to hear. For someone else, God, blow a fresh wind across the coals of their hearts where the ashes have begun to gather for others take me back to my first love take me back to my first love where I need to be for some carrying the weight and the burden of a sin or the sin of their life God let us know today that forgiveness is found at your feet have your way have your way have your way in a moment I'm going to give an invitation yes we are that church an invitation for prayer you came with a multitude of things already that you could take to the altar and talk to him about I mean you need healing deliverance we believe in healing we would love to anoint you and pray for you you need deliverance in your life we believe that who the sun sets free is free indeed All that you need is found in Him. But the invitation is extended today. The net is thrown out for somebody today who may need to rededicate your life to the Lord. You may need to go back to the cross. For someone who is hearing the message of the cross and you realize this was all done for me, it's not pretty, it's not glorious, but it's true. Invitation is given. Come find a place to pray and let us pray with you. What would today, how would today be different if you walked out of here knowing that things were settled. I'm right with God. What must I do to be saved? What must I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Prodigal, son or daughter. We all know about that. Somebody say amen. I know all about it. I also know what it's like to come home and find that fatty calf already ready. Thank God for it. I give an invitation if you're a prodigal son or daughter or if you have a son or a daughter that's prodigal from the father this morning what better time or place to take them to the altar this morning and pray God I leave them once again in your hand there's so much to pray for about in here this morning but what's burning in me today is that there are believers in here that know the church needs revival the, not little church but the church the church needs revival So if you've got nothing else to pray about this morning, find a place to pray. God, send the fire once again. Don't let us be boring churches. Let us be burning churches. Send the fire once again, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to preach you. Thank you. Now have your way. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.